Okay, the recording has started, Clarice, so go ahead. Okay, um, my name is Clarice Spawn. I'm an Earth and Space Science major with an environmental track at Columbus State. And for this GIS project, I've chosen to um, kind of combine my area of interest with GIS. So I've created a map of human contact with critical habitats. Um, critical habitats here is in reference to habitats of threatened and endangered species in the United States. And as you can see, the representation of that is in brown. Um, I have little black plus signs in areas of high human traffic. So um, those are visitor centers and campgrounds. And I'm about to read off my phone, so sorry for the pause. You're good, go ahead. I basically wanted to view human activity in concordance with endangered species habitats to see the potential damage humans could do. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have pictures of the map that I have along the way. So this is the final product. Cool. Uh, okay. Can you see this right here? Yes, I can see your document there now. Okay. So this is my first map. Um, basically, I imported data from the Fish and Wildlife Services of the United States. And this is vector data in point, line, and polygon. Um, for the, the little black stars in this map, if you can tell those are black stars, those are all areas of um campgrounds and visitor services and there are some in alaska i just didn't include that in the screenshot but the red and pink is all critical habitats and then where else right here i filtered i filtered out um, all areas. So basically, this is this is my map that I have, and I imported this map into ArcGIS Pro and set it up and made my layout and everything. Um, this is all visitor services and campground, so high human areas completely within critical habitats or within 200 feet of critical habitats. And these are those critical habitats. So I did um, an analysis on that. And then right here, which this is not my final map. I just wanted to play around with an analysis. Um, I looked at the human areas within or completely within 200 feet or completely within that threatened and endangered, which is still considered critical habitat species. Um, these are just endangered species habitats. And I'm, if I remember correctly, there are some in Alaska, which is mostly the polar bear and some kind of salmon, I think, some kind of fish. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot up there in Maine. There's some in this part of the United States, which that is in a stream. Um, I looked at the individual species for this map, and it actually included the Atlantic salmon, the whooping crane, Mississippi sandhill crane, yellow-shouldered blackbird, marina crow, Southwestern willow flycatcher, razorback sucker, ponytail, Guam Micronesian kingfisher, Florida leafwing butterfly, which I know you can't really see it, but it's down here. And then Bartram hair streak butterfly. 
Um, so as you can see, most of the endangered species potentially coming into contact with humans is inclusive of birds, fish, and insects. I think that might be my last map. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm going to flip um, it back to the main. Sure. While you're okay. doing that, I'll um, just ask, you know, if you were if you were going to give a presentation to the new Secretary of the Interior, which, by the way, we have a new one uh, with the new president, um, and you were going to maybe make an argument based on the map that you made and the research that you did, what kind of advice might you give to the Secretary of the Interior for the management of U.S. national park sites in terms of its high human trafficking area, not trafficking, human trafficking <laughs> areas, <laughs> goodness. That was that was one <laughs> like wording that I ran into because I was trying to type it out. I was like, high human trafficking, no, nope, that whoops. sounds weird. <laughs> That's the wrong kind of traffic. <laughs> whoops, yeah. Um, yeah, since, what, what advice might you give right. about planning these sites? Right, since I'm looking at um, human areas, which are obviously campgrounds and visitor services. Um, campgrounds tend to obviously be more, you know, sell like more unleashed, like people are kind of left to their own devices more. So I would definitely say um, if there hasn't already been implemented, then to implement more um, awareness maybe in these areas hey, we have these species in this area, please be careful, please don't litter like humans tend to do. Um, I would definitely say, may, I mean, I wouldn't restrict air, like restrict human contact with those areas, but I would definitely look into some form of an awareness, maybe if there isn't already in that area because you don't want people camping on and visiting in your land without knowing what danger they could potentially be causing um the planning of these areas obviously i would include to help the populations of these animals that are endangered um if i remember correctly up in maine there were to fish hatcheries and so I think that is actually one example of you know this something that is endangered in that area gotcha yeah um does that answer I, your question on that okay. It does. Yeah, it does. One thing that came to mind for me is that, um, you know, oftentimes when you when you go do some backpacking or camping in these sites, especially if it's a backcountry site, but, you know, even if it's not, even if it's a regular campground area, um, you typically have to get some sort of permit or reservation in advance. If it's a backcountry site, you also you also sometimes have to do like a full sort of backcountry wilderness training. It usually doesn't take that long. It's like a 30 minute video you have to watch and you have to do a little workshop with the park ranger to make sure that you're especially and, and I'm drawing on my experience when I used to I used to work at Yellowstone National Park for a summer we had to do this to get our backcountry camping permit uh, we had to learn about like bear safety and how mm -hmm. to hang your pack correctly so that mm -hmm. bears don't get into it it might be interesting to sort of target some of these areas where you have to get a reservation or a permit to incorporate some sort of educational element about the endangered species in that area as part of the reservation or permit acquisition process um, so that everybody is educated when they visit these sites about what endangered species are there and what are some strategies and, and things that they need to do to mitigate their negative impact on those species. That's what came to mind for me. I agree with that. I think that's well put. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ivy, Chase, questions for Clarice's map? Sorry. 
So not so much of a question so much as I think it's really interesting that like <clears throat> it looks like there's a lot of um, like a like a larger concentration of critical habitats with campgrounds and stuff in the Pacific Northwest versus everywhere else. So um, except Maine, it looks like. So I, I guess my question is like, um, sorry, my fan is going, but um, my question is um, in places like Florida where you know that there's a lot of um, reserved wildlife, um, are, is there, are there not a lot of campgrounds in those areas or like, are they just not accessible to people or do they just not care? Um, like, like in places where you know there's reserved wildlife, um, like why is there, like why are, why are those places lacking, um, lacking those kinds of campgrounds and visitor services where you know that like, it can kind of be um, an experience where these people can can see that wildlife and um, uh, like kind of understand um, more about what's going on. Sorry if my question's unclear. I see what you're saying. So you're saying it's kind of improportional that like Florida has, it seems as though it has like more of an equal amount of um, species to visitor sites so that people can potentially go there and learn about the species, whereas in the yeah. Pacific North, okay. Yeah. Um, I know that in, if you're talking specifically about like in the con continuous United States, not really in Alaska. Yeah, yeah, um, that's, yeah, that's sorry. I should have mentioned that. Yeah. No, 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 you're fine. Um, I know that those specifically, I don't know if you, I know you can kind of see it right here. I'm going to try to zoom in. No, I don't think it's going to work. But if you look, these all right here are streams. So um, those are streams too, I think, in bodies of water. Um which lead me to believe that it is like fish. And I remember clicking on a lot of them. It's like obscure, like mollusks and stuff like that. Um, so I think that there probably is not as many areas for observation. Cause you know, mm -hmm. if you go and you walk in Florida and there's an endangered like mammal, you know, you try to spot the mammal or you look at the butterfly if there's, an endangered butterfly, but it's kind of harder to do that with fish. You can right. just go okay. and that makes sense. Serve. Yeah, I think that is the case for that. Chase, what about you? Got a question for Clarice before we wrap up? Yes, um, you probably already answered this. I apologize, but uh, the data do you? Um, uh, the, the the definition of critical hab habitats, um, who who defines that, and is it local government or is it uh, researchers? You know, do you know who funds these people? Um, could uh, my my question is, could the reason why, like you know, in California, Oregon, Pacific Northwest, there's crit more critical habits is because you know we've determined that those are critical habitats because you know we've done more research into it while down in the south where people might not care about critical habitats there's critical habitats it's just they're either gone or or people don't care enough to to really look at the critical habitats um right so i can't speak on the research in relation to the areas of people but i gathered my data from the united states fish and wildlife service so um my assumption is that they evaluate the United States as a whole and then upload their data onto their website. Um, critical habitats is, if I remember correctly, it's something that I kind of took from their um, website. They had uh, habitats of endangered species, habitats of threatened species, but I actually 
define this. Um, the term critical habitats is used here in reference to habitats of species which are classified as endangered or threatened by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. So yeah. that makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good question, Chase, and nicely done, Clarice. I think, you know, since it's a federally uh, sourced data set, I would venture to say that there's a, probably a pretty high level of trust that, uh, you know, the folks who did this research and determined these areas were taking as systematic an approach to the whole country as, as they could. Um, but again, Chase, a, a really nice question. And I think right. important to bring out some of those regional variations in the values of how we think about, you know, conservation, how we think about, in your case, Chase, Confederate monuments, sometimes those regional variations can come across really strongly in some of these maps. Um, but yeah, really nice work, Clarice, all around. Great job on your project. Thank um, you. If nobody has anything else they would like to add, I'm going to uh, stop the video here.